Thank you for coming out this evening uh, to the Mount Vernon Baptist Temple. And we got a little echo over on the right. We've got some new speakers, so we'll, we'll give a little. There we go. I think that's good. All right. So let's turn over to page 530, a shelter in time of storm. We're looking at going through trials this, uh, this evening many times. And so we'll start off page 530, a shelter in the time of storm. And let's have everyone stand. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever I'll be tied. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes upright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, refuge dear. A shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. And page 766, I believe the answer's on the way, a chorus. And let's sing out that chorus. As we go through trials, we understand the answer is on the way. I believe the answer's on the way. I believe the Lord has heard me pray. Cast not away your confidence, said the Lord our God. Now by faith in Him we own I stand, firmly held by His almighty hand, fully trusting in his promise, praise the Lord. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for your word, and we can trust in it, lean on it. I pray now as we are here this evening, Lord, that you would uh, give us something from your word. We pray for the speakers, that you would bless them and just direct them, help us as we sing here. And lift up your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. And we gave out some handouts for some songs. Everyone get one. Were there any left? All right. Okay. So we'll sing a couple. And what we want to try to do on Sunday night is teach you a couple songs. And so we're going to start off with Creation sings creation sings and uh, so we'll start off and I'll let Gretchen play one time through
tune there, but let's try it out here now. Creation sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson rays. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, his breath upon this flaming cloak. He chants the eagles flying, commands the newborn baby's cry. Alleluia! Let all creation stand and sing. Alleluia! Fill the earth with songs of worship. How the wonders of creation sing. All right, we sing it one time through. There's a little tricky part on the second line to the end. You see it says, hallelujah, and then there's a little break, so you take a little breath there. Okay, and that gets some of us. So let's do verse one again. We're gonna try to teach it this over the next few weeks, so we'll sing just one here. Creation, sing the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson rays. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, his breath upon this spinning globe. He charts the eagle's fly, commands the newborn baby's cry. Alleluia! Let all creation stand and sing. Alleluia! Fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of creation king all right now you get to turn it over good job we give you an a an a on that one so good job now we're going to try when trials come all right so this time go ahead grudge of a tune, but let's try it out here. And again, we're singing on trials this evening, and as you think about trials, all of us go through trials, don't we? Whatever trial you might say, oh, I'm not really going through trials, and you're probably lying, but because uh, all of us have trials of some type. And, uh, you know, we think of 2 Corinthians, the Word of God tells us, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comfort us on us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, we have God to look to. He's always there. Humans don't always do us right. And of course, we can lean on him. And even as we sing the first song, but let's sing this when trials come. We'll do verse one to start. Trials come no longer fear, for in him the pain our God draws near. Too far a faith worth more than gold, and there his faithfulness is told, and there his faithfulness is told. Let's try verse 1 again. When trials come, no longer fear, for in the pain our God draws near to fire a faith worth more than gold. And there his faithfulness is 
tone and there his faithfulness is told let's try verse two when in the night i know your peace the breath of god brings strength to me and new each morning mercies flow as treasures of darkness grows as treasures of the darkness grows verse three i turn to wisdom not my own for every battle you have known my confidence will rest in Praying for the Henson family this evening and the Henson he mentioned in his letter the struggle of having good Bible teaching, Bible doctrinal churches in Oklahoma. And a lot of churches that are preaching and doctrine and are not really giving the word of God to the Georgian people. Um, and they're struggling with getting getting churches that out, when the even the churches that preach in Georgian, the language there, um, they are teaching more of a works that you can lose your salvation. There's not a security of the believer. And so when you're witnessing, it's more an admonition to do good works than actually preaching the gospel to these people. So they're struggling with, with all of that. And there's a man, thankfully, and then, of course, when he's, of course, an American over there trying to preach to them, and you can imagine people not wanting to listen to a foreigner, teach them religion, and so they're struggling with that. But there is a man that he's working with that, that is a pastor in, a, in a, a church two hours away, and he's willing to come and help them get this church going and started and helping get preach right, right doctrine to his people. And so that is their goal to see that happen. And they're praying that this can be a, a good fellowship with this, with this pastor who wants to preach the word and that they can see growth with the church people there. So I'll pray for um, Michael Henson at this time. Father, thank you for the Hensons and their desire to see a church um, developed that can preach in the native heart language of the people and not just in Russian, but also, Lord, of helping them with their doctrine, that they can share Christ's love with them and to share um, their need of just following the biblical truths presented in the Word of God. I do pray for this pastor and his, his desire to preach the Word. They can fellowship with him and that he can help them with his church plant and get it up and running. We thank you for the, the desire they have to see God work in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this evening, church family. I so appreciate that. And thank you, guests, those of you that are, that are here tonight. And it's a blessing. If you've got your bulletins, pull them out. I just want to make a couple of announcements. The first one, the big one, on May 4th, those of you that are in our nursery or our children's ministries, that includes our master clubs, our children's church, our school, we are offering, and we're, we're putting, paying the cost ourselves, but offering a, a CPR class. We really want to make sure that those that are working in those ministries are CPR certified. They know what to do in the event of a situation. And so that is coming up on May 4th. What I need from you, church family, there's two classes, one at 10 o'clock until noon, and then one at 12.30 until 2.30. It's a two-hour class. Sign up in the foyer. Maximum amount of people that we can get in every class, in each class, is 20. Uh, so that should be enough to cover the majority of us, uh, but please make sure that you sign up. Avail yourself to this. Don't go, oh, I got this. I took CPR back in high school. Okay, no, you don't have this. Things have changed uh, even over the years that I've been certified numerous different times. Something new is being tweaked and changed because we're realizing, wait, if we do it this way, it produces better results. More lives are saved, or here's the, what to do. And we're talking infants, uh, especially in the nursery, right? So how to perform, and we don't say the word Heimlich anymore. That family has sued for, for the use of their name, even though he was the inventor of it. And so you no longer say that. See, you just learned something new. You need to go to CPR class to learn the rest of it. You're like, what? It's always been the Heimlich. I know, but it's now illegal to say it. And you could get sued. No, not really. But, okay, they just don't want you to say it. 
But, but, you know, working with a baby that may be choking is substantially different than working with an adult. Uh, working with a baby in regards to CPR is substantially different than working with even a, a young boy, six, seven, eight years old, than an adult. And so I just, those of you in the nursery, please avail yourself to that. I do, I do appreciate that. You know, we're putting on the cost, and it'll be a huge blessing and a benefit, but we need to know how many are signed up to make sure that we have everything that we need. So thank you for that, for that as well. And then you see in the bulletin, just the other events coming up, next Sunday after the morning service, our, our seasoned saints luncheon with our teenagers are going to be serving you. Uh, not everybody, because we couldn't get everybody in on this one, I've mentioned it, but just make sure if you did get an invite for this first go-round, and it was just random selection, uh, there was no who gets to go when, but just random selection to make sure that we, you know, once we reached a number. Uh, but RSVP to Pastor Chad or Miss Elizabeth, and I appreciate that. It would be a blessing to them to know, uh, but thank you. And then also next Sunday night, we're going to have our first quarterly business meeting. So right after the evening service, church family will meet and discuss some of the exciting changes that we're making and, and what God is doing here and just talk and make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and God is, God is going to do a mighty work, continue through our church. And then the 27th, right, 27th is a men's prayer breakfast, so 8.30 in the morning. Gentlemen, just make note of that. I appreciate it. I'm excited, by the way, for what we have over here. We're shifting some things. We're moving some things around. I know that more of you play instruments, and I would love to encourage you to play an instrument for the Lord in his orchestra or band, whatever you want to call it, okay? It's not a praise band, but it's band, it's orchestra. It's really more of an instrumental ensemble than anything else. But if you play an instrument, I would love for you to play it for the Lord. Right now, we're working the bugs out. I'm sorry I'm drawing attention to those wonderful ladies over there, but we're working the bugs out right now, but soon enough, we really want to begin to produce it and, and have us play Sunday mornings as well as Sunday nights, and I would love to have more over there. So how many of you, you know, you got the kazoo down, right? You're like, Pastor, I got kazoo. I'm good to go. No, but even if you haven't played in a while, let's, let's break the rust off of that gift and that talent that God has given to you. The accordion. <laughs> what I'm hearing. We got some accordion players in here. You ready to play the accordion again? And Anthony's like, no, don't even talk to me. Don't even look at me. I'm, I'm busy on my phone. All right. All right. But thank you. Thank you for allowing us to just work. Things are changing. Things are growing. And it's, it's such a blessing to be a part of a growing and an active church. So, all right, let's stop. Let's sing one more time and then I'll come up and I'll introduce um, Ethan before before he opens up the word of God. But let's sing. Let's stand again. We're going to sing a wonderful song in times like these. But let's stand. Okay. 532. 532. I encourage you to look at the book. Well, actually, I might as well put this. Uh, but as you look at it, you would see that Ruth Cave Jones wrote it. She wrote it during World War II. And I wasn't thinking about this, but uh, because of all the stress from the war, she was a housewife and just sat down, wrote the words and the music. You can think about our world, maybe Jerusalem, families there that are dealing with war and uh, in times like these. And so hopefully we can remember the Lord is with us. But let's sing 532 in times like these. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Jesus, yes, he's the one, this 
help us with. You take the songs that you have, maybe fold them and put them right in the hymnal. We'll sing them next week. Thank you. I want to be a part of a church that not only is, is growing in numbers, but growing in our development of the next generation for Jesus Christ. I really do. I want to see younger people serving the Lord. I love it that Ben is an usher Sunday mornings. I love that Aiden was able to play the piano for our invitation. Uh, I love that Ethan is going to be preaching right now. I want to constantly be growing the next generation. Our children's ministries are going to be adapting to this a little bit more as well. Jedi, I want to talk to you about preparing a sermon and preaching here in about three months. Okay? Jedi believes God's been called of the Lord into ministry. Ethan as well. Aiden as well. Uh, Samuel as well, a new member. And so I want them coming on Sunday nights to start, sometimes every now and then Wednesdays. And um, then soon enough, Lord willing, get them on a Sunday morning. But just developing the next generation. I want younger people in our nurseries, in our children's ministries. And so I'm going to shut up because I want Ethan to come up and I want him to preach. I've looked at his sermon. We've talked about it. Uh, I'm excited. He's already better than I ever was at his age and probably better than I am too. So definitely better hair. But uh, come on up, Ethan. I want to pray with you. And then we're gonna, I'm going to let you get going here. Father. Thank you for Ethan, and thank you so much for the truth of your word. God, it's your word that is being spoken now, and I pray you'd help us to, to block out maybe the, the newness of this, or the excitement of this, but just, Lord, what do you have for us? Help us to have that mindset. Guide us now by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you notice in that song, Creation Sings, I noticed the one line, it said, Tell the wonders of creation's king. And I'm so thankful that tonight, the same God who created the world and the cosmos also created you and I. Amen. Such a blessing. Tonight, I'd like you to take the word of God with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And as you're flipping to that passage of scripture, I want you to think, have you ever had a bad day where you think to yourself, I was not ready for this at all? You just knew that you were not prepared one bit. Listen, I had a great day today, but there was a day this week where I was like, wow, I was not ready one bit. And it was all my fault because I was not prepared for what was coming after me. So what I want to go over tonight is what the Lord has offered us as preparation for the strategies and the wiles of Satan. We have this victory and we don't claim it as much as we really need to. You see, we have something that cannot be defeated, something that's already claimed the victory, that something is someone, and that someone is Jesus Christ. And you see, the way to think about it, and the best way that I was able to put this was, as an Ohio State fan, as an Ohioan in general, one thing that almost all of us can agree on, except for our Michigander, which is gone this week, <laughs> But one thing that we can all agree on is we love the Ohio State Buckeyes, right? So as an Ohio State fan, last year for the season, I had to miss a lot of games. I worked a lot of Saturdays, and I had to miss a lot of the games. So I'd constantly check the score on my phone, see, okay, we're up, we're good, we're up, we're good. Find out we won the game, everything's good, I'm happy, right? Then I'd go home after work, and I'd watch the reruns of the game. And as I'm watching the reruns of the game, I notice Kyle McCord threw an interception, or he got sacked and he fumbled the football or, you know, we, we lost a, a score due to a bad play, but it just didn't seem to bother me. It didn't shake me. You know, it didn't mess me up because I knew that we had won the game. So if you're saved tonight, I want you to relate that victory that we have there in yeah. Jesus. Amen. We already know the outcome. That's good. So if you're saved tonight, are you willing to trust that? Are you willing to trust that we have already claimed a victory in Jesus? So if you're, really, if you're willing to claim that victory, I want to show you how we can stop ourselves from getting shaken up and twisted around and beaten down all the time by the strategies of Satan. So in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start here in verse 10, the Word of God says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may, you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having the, on the bless, breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may be able to open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, help us to take it into our hearts tonight to be able to be prepared for what might come. Lord, help us to stay faithful to you and help us to be able to walk with Jesus down the easier path with the preparation that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this evening that you have given us. We love you and we pray this all in your name. Amen. So Ephesians is a great book. If there's one book in the Bible that I have read probably five times, it's the book of Ephesians. I love that book. Ephesians gives us so many great examples of different things such as it, it teaches us how not only should we be reconciled to God, but also to each other. It teaches us about the church, how to walk as a Christian. There's so many great points and great lessons in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> but Paul ends it with this in chapter 6. Finally, my brethren. Now, if that's not some emphasis, I don't know what is. Because after pouring his heart out in this long book, long letter that he wrote, he ends it with that. Finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord. Now, another thing that's said a lot in this passage of, of Scripture is the word stand. Now, what does that mean? Because when God says stand, he doesn't mean to physically be standing all the time. You don't have to stand like this all day long, not be able to move. Right? What the Lord is saying is if you want to be ready, you have to stand. You can't be sitting down being dormant. That is not what you can do, because if an attack comes, you are not prepared one bit for that. Now, the passage of Scripture here says stand four different times. And that's, as Brother Schwenke would say, a lot of ink to use in the Bible to say the same thing over and over again. <laughs> now, we know that repetition in the Bible is God's emphasis on certain things. So I would say that standing and being ready is a pretty big thing if you're going to wear this armor of God and be prepared for your day. So, to stand. And not only stand, but he says, stand in the power of God's might. Now, I can stand alone all day long, but I'm going to get knocked down. I can tell you that. My parents are here tonight, and if there's one thing that they can pledge on for me, is that I have been a very pride-filled person for many, many years. I stood alone. And if it was... If I couldn't do it by myself, I couldn't do it at all. That's the, the kind of life that I lived for a while, and that's how I was. And they will also attest to you that that pride got me nowhere. Standing alone got me absolutely nowhere. We need to stand with the Lord and in the power of His might. It seems pretty simple. However, a lot of times we drift away. We think, okay, God got me through that. Now, I can stand alone until I need him again. That's not how it works. That is not how it works at all. If you stand alone at any point in your life and take your eyes off of the Lord, that's when you fall the hardest. We have to be willing to go that extra mile. And the reason that we need to be willing to go that extra mile is because the one who's after us, he certainly will go the extra mile to get us. And that's why we need to always be prepared and always be standing so God's telling you here, stand in my power because you have none. We are nothing compared to what could come after us. So when God says to stand in my power, that's it. I mean, it seems pretty simple. It seems like, okay, God's all powerful. He's almighty. It seems pretty simple. If I stand in his power, nothing's going to get me. And that's true. But you have to stand in his power. That's the difference. And so that's definitely a tough one for us today because a lot of us think that 
You know, it's, life's, life's pretty easy when it's, when it's good. But if you're not with the Lord even when it's good, and you're not walking with Jesus while it's good, it's going to go right back to bad. Because that's... I mean, that's the time that Satan has the best opportunity to get you. As soon as you take your eyes off of the Lord, that's when you fall. Think about when Peter was walking on water, he took his eyes off the Lord for one second, and down he went. It's a great story, and uh, it's, it's a great one to pull a lesson from, because as soon as you take your eyes off of Jesus, that's when you go down. And secondly here, God says to suit up. So... Suiting up doesn't mean, okay, well, you know what, today I'll put on the breastplate, but I'll leave everything else off because I feel like that's all I need. Or today, I'll I'll wear the belt of truth. God's word says, put on the whole armor of God. That seems pretty clear. You can't just wear whatever you want to wear that day. I mean, think about our clothes. The clothes we wear, I'd say to go out in public, you need to be fully dressed, right? And that's, that's... a pretty common role that we have. So that's how we need to be with the Lord as well. We can't just wear one piece and think that we're good because wherever we aren't wearing it, that's where we'll get hit the hardest. And Satan knows that. So that's one reason that we need to suit up. Another reason is that in our world today, we're in a war. We all know that. Now, there's a difference between the war that we're in and the God that we're serving. Because as Pastor Layman said this morning, yes, we are in a war, but no, we do not worship a God of war. There's a big difference there. Huge difference. The God that we worship is a God of love and peace, and that's what God wants for all of creation. However, it's our job to spread that to the lost, to the people who don't know of God's word. So we're in a war, but I'll tell you, the war that we are in The most important part where the core comes from is right here. This is where we're in the biggest war. Because if you can't win a war in here, you don't stand a chance with a war around you. So the war that we have inside of us is the spiritual battle that we face almost every day as Christians, I would say. I mean, we face so much lust and temptation, and it's it's hard. It's very hard to not fall to that unless you're wearing your armor. Now... One thing that I think we struggle with the most in the war that we face in our own hearts is apathy. That's one thing that we struggle with so much as Christians today. Here's what we do. We come in Sunday morning, Pastor Layman's preaching, man, I'm so excited. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear this message and walk out of here with a good lesson, right? It's the only time I get to hear him preach, even though he preaches three times a week, just saying. But... Sunday morning, you come in, you hear a good message, and you walk out of here, man, ready to go. I can't wait to go out there and spread God's word. I got my armor on, I'm ready to go. And then you leave it at the church doors. That's the issue. That's what we do. We come in, we hear something good, we think that we can pull a lesson from it, and then we leave it right where we left it, or where, we, where we picked it up. We leave it right at the church doors. And then we go out into the world, nothing. We have nothing to help us, nothing to protect us, anything. That's the biggest war that we face today in Christianity is just lack of, I guess, motivation to live for Christ, to walk with Christ. It's such a strong thing that we, that we have to deal with, but it's beatable. It's certainly beatable. <clears throat> now, as preachers and as pastors and as Christians or just preachers of the Word of God, we face a lot of pushback, a lot of criticism, and just a, a lot of negative emotion, very strong negative emotion. And here, the Word of God describes it as fiery darts or fiery arrows. Now, I was wondering, why fiery? That's so weird to me. Fiery. Why do they have to be lit on fire? And I was thinking, you know, back in the day, back in the Indian times, way before any of us, they used fiery darts. And the reason that they used fiery darts was not to shoot at other people, but it was to shoot at the big capes on the boats. And that's because when it hit, then your boat's on fire. 
And you can't fight a war while you're surrounded in fire. And I was like, man, that's a good way to relate that. Because that's the attack that we face. Not only are we being directly hit, the things around us are also catching fire. And we need to be very, very careful of that. And lastly, in this, ver- or in this passage here, Paul says, Therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And right above that, he also says that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's so, so important in our world today. Spreading the truth of God's word is so important because the return is coming. I mean, each day that comes, we are a day closer to the return of Jesus. And that's important to get that word out there. We have lost souls that we are in a battle to get. And that's what we need to understand. So when Paul says speak boldly, I imagine it's the same way that we speak of our favorite celebrities, actors, musicians, famous people in general. I mean, here's my thing. I'm a huge basketball fan. I love basketball. One of my favorite players is Russell Westbrook. Okay? A lot of people, if you know basketball, don't like Russell Westbrook. They can't stand him. They say he can't shoot, he can't do this, he can't do that. Whatever it may be. And I'm very quick to jump on and say, that's not true. I'm very quick to jump on there and defend him and speak boldly of the skill that he has. But sometimes, I'm not like that with Jesus. And why is that? I mean, we face the negative Emotion, the pushback, the criticism, we face all of these things. And we're not jumping up to defend Jesus like we are other humans on our planet. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you think about it. Russell Westbrook doesn't even know who I am. Our famous celebrities, they don't even know who we are. But the man that we're not willing to defend died for me? It just doesn't make any sense to me. You see, what we do is we get the urge to speak of Jesus, to speak of the Word, and then we think, is this person going to think that I'm some religious nutcase? Some crazy Christian guy who just goes around nothing but Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what we think. And it's sad. It's very sad. Because those souls who we should be preaching to are not getting the Word of God. They're not even getting a seed planted. And that's the biggest struggle that we face today is just we cannot pull ourselves together enough to be able to speak boldly of Jesus. It's another part of apathy. Pastor Layman comes in, he preaches. I love it. I can't wait to go tell my friends about that. You don't even know what it is by the time you get to the car. You don't even remember. You didn't pay enough attention. You didn't care enough to go out and and spread it. Whatever it may be, that's such a problem that we face today. And so if we get up in the morning and we suit up in our armor of God, one thing that God promises, and he says it here multiple times, is protection. And that's something that we surely need in our world today. I mean, America is falling, let's be honest, and we need protection as God's children And this is the way to get it. The armor of God is so, so important. And like I said earlier today, if I had just woken up that morning this week and said, Lord, I'm going to put on my armor and I'm not going to let anything get to me. Maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't have been so selfish that day and gotten myself into such a terrible, negative, bad mood. And maybe that day would have gone a little bit better because I would have been prepared. And that's something that we need to realize tonight. So as we go forth with our week, I just want to challenge us to do one thing, and that is to be prepared and see how your week goes compared to a normal week. I mean, these bad weeks that we're having or these bad days that we're having, it all roots back to I could have been a lot more prepared for that I could have definitely taken better care of myself in this situation, or I I could have 
But you don't need to think back and think, man, I could have handled that better. I could have done this better. If you were just prepared. Such a huge thing. So that's all I challenge you for this week, is just to be prepared. Help yourself to get ready for what may come, because I tell you what, it could come at any moment, and it's the strategy of Satan is a lot better than the strategy of me. Regardless of how much I want to say, Satan, you can't get me, he's got a lot more power than I've got, but my God's got a lot more power than he's got. And that strategy will be shut down real quick by my almighty God's strategy. So church family, I just pray that you can prepare yourselves more as you're going forth with this week. Help yourselves to just have a better week as as you go. See how well it works out for you because one thing I can promise you and that I'm sure God could also promise you is it's going to go a lot better. Father, thank you. Thank you for tonight. Just thank you for allowing us to gather together in your house. And Lord, surrounded by your people, help us to be prepared for what may come. Lord, guide us in the right direction as we go forth. Help us as we need it. Lord, we love you so much. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Stand up. If we're going to be prepared for what our day is going to bring, we've got to stand up in his might. Yep. Suit up in his armor. Amen. And speak up for his kingdom. Amen. All right. I love it. All right. I love it, man. Those were his points, by the way, not mine. I just tweaked them slightly. So, amen. I love it. Thank you so much, Ethan. You're there. You've got your Bibles open. Grab them and go to John chapter 10, if you would, please. John chapter 10. Do you think Jesus stood up and was prepared? Do you think Jesus suited up every day when he went forth to an enemy that hated his guts? you think he spoke up? For the Lord's kingdom? He did, didn't he? We're actually there in this passage of Scripture, John chapter 10. I'll back up to verse 39 of John chapter 9 here in a minute. But Jesus is dealing with a horrible situation that should have never taken place. Right? John chapter 9. You've got this blind man. He's blind from birth. And he is destroying or condemning, judging, verse 39, this false narrative, this false religion, these false teachings that are prevalent in his day. But why he's so hot about it, if I can put it in that terminology, why he's standing up so firmly and and strongly is because people are messing with his sheep. They're messing with with who God has brought him to to have. Between John chapter 9 and John chapter 10, all the way down to verse 21 of John chapter 10, there's no break. Really, it's all one story. So we're going to back up to verse 39 where we have the the powerful verse. Jesus says, "For for judgment or condemnation, for judgment, I am come into this world that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? And verse 41, all the way down, we're going to keep reading for a little bit. And we're hearing his response. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Father, guide us in understanding this parable, this proverb tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how long we'll be here. No, I'm just kidding. We'll only be here for a few more minutes. Um, We're we're only going to get to the beginning of this tonight, and it's okay. Uh, We'll we'll shift, and God will do something different next week. We'll stay in this passage. But you have here a response by Jesus. He is standing up. He's suited up, and he is speaking up now 
for his kingdom, for his sheep, if you will. And he gives a, a parable at verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them. But it's a different word in the Greek for parable than we've seen every other time. This word for parable, actually every other time it's translated in Scripture, is a proverb. But the challenge, and, and it's not an incorrect translation, I really don't like it. I read people that were like, it should have been translated this way. No, it should have been translated this way. God knew what he was doing when, we, when the translators translated it. This parable, spakey. This parable is different than every other parable that we have in Scripture. It's more of a proverbial parable. It's not a proverb that's just like a one-liner. You know, it's, it's an explanation, but it's a dark saying. And the reason he speaks in parables, it's been a while since we've been there. In fact, January of 2023 is the last time you and I, as we sat down together in the life of Jesus, covered the parables all the way back to Matthew chapter 13. It's been a while since we've heard Jesus speak a parable. But he speaks this parable because he wants to prevent those that don't understand to understand but he wants those that will understand to understand this parable or this proverb is one of the most challenging in all of scripture because this parable is actually used very incorrectly by a lot of false religions calvinists will claim john chapter 10 is one of their proof texts we're going to get there trust me and we're going to have some fun when we get to that one in verse 26 but you know you've got others that will prove but that they, they try to argue that this parable or the sheepfold is a picture of heaven. But it's not. And you're trying to climb up some other way. It's not. Tonight, with the time that we have, I'm only going to get us the ability to understand the elements of the parable. Hopefully give you a little bit of an explanation with it. You've already heard the preaching from Ethan, so this is the teaching. All right, we're going to understand and unpack this parable that Jesus says, beginning in verse 41 of John 9. It says, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now, ye say we see... Therefore, your sin remaineth. Jesus says, you think you see? Let me explain something to you about the kingdom of God. See if you understand it. Because you say you see. You say you understand. Let's see if you do. Of a truth, verily, verily, I say unto you. So he's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to these that are debating with him from verse 40. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words. So I say unto you, Pharisees, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What I want to do tonight is just break down this parable and its elements. I want us to understand the elements. Because next week when we gather together, and we see beginning in verse 7, it's more of the context of it. Hopefully then we'll have a better understanding. And we just move faster through it. But this conversation, there are four different people that are listening to this. The first is the disciples, right? They're there. The second group of people is this blind beggar. He's there. He's recently accepted Jesus as Lord in verse 38. Lord, I believe you're the Messiah, basically. And he worshiped him. So you got the disciples, you got the blind beggar. Thirdly, you've got the Pharisees, the antagonistic and the hostile group. Right? They're back and forth. They're struggling. But then you have a scattering of other people, scattering of Jews. And in this context, in this parable, let's break it down. You've got the sheepfold. And that's in verse 1. He that entereth not by the door into the sheep fold now for contextual purposes you've got to keep an understanding who's the sheepfold what's the sheepfold you got to keep it within the context within what jesus is speaking the sheepfold is israel and we understand this and we didn't read it tonight but if you look down in verse 16 he says and other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and he continues but when jesus is speaking of the sheepfold here he is speaking about Israel as a whole. Right? Just keep that in mind because not everyone that's an Israelite is of Israel. Jesus deals with that later, but it's Israel. It's not a reference to heaven. Some people will make that jump. It's not correct doctrine to say that. Okay? You've got the door of the sheepfold. That door we know is Jesus. How do we know that? Verse 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Right? Those are pretty cut and dry. The sheepfold, it's Israel. The door is Jesus. The only way into the sheepfold is through him. And I'm just going to give you a little snippet here. The reason why is because of who he is as the Messiah. He's the anointed one. The only way you're going to continue with Israel 
as an Israelite or with Israel is you've got to come through me. You've got to accept the reality that I'm the Messiah. If you don't, you have no part in this. Okay, that's why he's saying, I'm the door. I'm the only way in. The next group we have in verse 1 is the, the thief and the robber. This individual or these people that climb up some other way. This is a jab directly at the scribes and the Pharisees. This is him saying, I'll see if you understand what I'm saying here. You got some people that are trying to get into the sheepfold some other way. These individuals are nothing more than thieves and robbers. What they're trying to do is grab the sheep for themselves and pull them away from the truth of God and who I am. These thieves and these robbers, they don't enter in through the door because they're going to refuse to re and re reject Jesus as the Messiah. Their goal is not to protect and love the sheep, but to destroy the sheep. And then in this parable, you have a porter in verse 3. Now who's the porter? I won't tell you. We have no idea. And actually, to be honest with you, he's completely irrelevant to this entire passage. I read so many commentaries. I was even reading them again this afternoon, trying to wrap my brain around it, and they're all over the place. And they're like, the porter is the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, but that's not what he's talking about here. This isn't heaven. This isn't the Spirit drawing people. So who's the porter? Historically speaking, the sheepfold was a massive area that was protected, that was walled in, whether it was by fences that they built or, or maybe just a valley in an area that was surrounded by some hills and, and such. There was an individual that would protect and guard the gate. Okay, that was known as the porter. I, I think Jesus is just helping them with this illustration and he throws in this man. It has nothing to do spiritually. They don't try to spiritualize the Bible, right? Just accept what it says. So who's the porter? I don't know. Some random guy that vanishes from the scene as soon as Jesus mentions it. Okay, it's not the Spirit of God, it's not anyone else, but the porter opens the sheep, and the sheep hear his, that's the shepherd to him, the shepherd of the sheep in verse 2. The shepherd is Jesus. How do we know that? Verse 11. All right, whenever you're looking at the Bible, trying to understand what does it say, you always, in context, look for it. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So verse 7, I'm the door. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So in Jesus' illustration, can I ask you, church family, who's the emphasis? Jesus. Keep that in mind. We're going to get there next week because we're going to look at who Jesus really is and this illustration that he brings. It's so powerful in the reality of the I am statements in the Bible. I'm going to have some fun next week looking at, Lord willing, but looking at who Jesus is from this passage. I'm excited for it. But he's the shepherd. He's the door. As a shepherd, he's the watcher of the sheep. Right? So who are the sheep in this parable? Israel. I thought Israel was the sheepfold. Yeah. So who are the individual sheep? Those that accept Jesus as the Messiah as Israelites. You and I aren't in here yet because that's why Jesus says in verse 16, I got some others I'm going to go get. I got some others that are going to believe on me. Those are the Gentiles. Those are you and I tonight. But right now, in our context, these sheep, those are the individuals, like this blind man, who these people tried to cast out, who these people refused to accept in. He says, no, 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 he's mine. Because he believes in me. You have the sheep. These parabolistic aspects of it. I know I'm giving you a lot. We're just teaching tonight. Okay, I'm not going into preaching. I'm not going into points. We're just teaching tonight. But here's the last thought. I got four minutes before I'm going to stop and we're going to pray. I won't even have an invitation tonight. But what is Jesus doing? Whenever you have a parable, you need to ask why. Why is he choosing to speak in a dark saying? Why is he choosing to speak in, in uttering something that is blocking certain people off from it and, and others to understand it? And the truth is, when Jesus claims to be the shepherd, the key is verse 2. Okay, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So he enters in the door, he is the door, but he's also the shepherd. He's claiming, and this is the powerful drop that Jesus is making here. He's claiming, I am God. Now, I'll explain that over the next few weeks, because he's going to hit it over and over and over again. You get down to verse 30, man, I am the Father or one. Woo, that's a good one. Right, but he's claiming, I am God. How do I know that? Because let me give you some Old Testament examples. In Psalm 23, 
what do we have? Don't we have God, our shepherd? The Lord is my, what? Shepherd. How about Psalm 77 and verse 20? Thou, God, lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. In Psalm 90, or I'm sorry, Psalm 79, verse 13, so we, thy people, and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. Psalm 80 and verse 1, give ear, O shepherd of Israel. So can I ask, in all of those statements, who's the shepherd of Israel? God is. Do you understand that? So according to the Old Testament, who is the shepherd of Israel? God. Let me give you some New Testament examples to help you understand that Jesus is the shepherd. Matthew 18, verse 12. He's the shepherd who will risk his life to seek and to save that one lost sheep. In Matthew 9, and verse 36, he's the shepherd who has pity upon the people because they are as sheep having no shepherd. And in Mark 14, verse 27, he quoted an Old Testament truth all shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And then in Luke 12, 32, he's the shepherd who called his disciples a little flock. Peter later declared that he is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. The writer of Hebrews says he's the great shepherd of the sheep. What is Jesus doing with this parable? Why is he speaking it in a parable? Because if he comes out and he says, hey, everybody, I want you to know I'm God... It's going to create a firestorm. But if he comes out and he says, I want you to know something. I'm the shepherd. I'm the door. Their eyes and their minds are going to drift back and you're going to go, wait a minute. No, God's the shepherd. So if you're claiming to be the shepherd, you're claiming what? He's God. I want you to just take that nugget with you tonight. Just understand that. This passage and, and I'm not saying you're going to prove to anybody who's a denier that Jesus is God, you're going to prove that he is God. They're going to argue this away like they do so many other passages of Scripture. But I want you to take heart in just the reality and the truth that Jesus in this passage, honestly more than any other that I have found as I've studied his life, he goes into it. And he lets them know, i got a problem with you Pharisees. You cast this man out. You refuse to help this blind man. But I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Because I'm the true shepherd. Because I'm the, sh the, the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. And if you want to enter into this sheepfold that you say you're a part of, then you're going to need to come through me. You keep climbing up some other way, and you know what? You're nothing more than a thief and a robber. Trying to steal those sheep, trying to destroy those sheep, trying to murder those sheep. He's going to start to get into you're nothing more than your father who, who is of the devil. He's going to get into it tonight with these guys it's a powerful reality he is the tender shepherd who loves and cares and watches over his sheep we're done we're gonna stop there i know it's a weird place to stop but just for sake of time and trust me when we get into beginning in verse seven it's going to get so exciting i'm looking forward to that next week but man i'm excited for what god is doing i'm excited for jesus i'm excited for the truth of god's word and i want you to be excited but i want you to be excited to go and tell somebody about jesus can i ask are you going to stand up for him this week yeah. i got one yeah you're going to stand up for him this week yeah. right or are you going to sit back and and let the challenge of this life blow you over are you going to stand up and be prepared are you going to suit up remember it's his armor it's not ours right it's his power we're standing in but then you're going to speak up more important than anything else, honestly, we, we got to do it in that order. Right? i got to stand up first, suit up second, and then speak up third. I don't want to speak up without his armor on. I'm going to get destroyed. Yeah. Right? But we need to be speaking up. You know, that, that utterance may be given unto me to preach or speak the gospel boldly. Yeah. Right? We need to speak up to a lost world. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this time in church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the reality of Jesus and who he is. Help us this week. Bless in a mighty way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, church family. I'll see you Tuesday night as we go out into our community and share the gospel. 6.30. Thank you. God bless.